This is the Aftermarket Radio Network. Hey, the gang's all here. Yep, we have the entire Aftermarket Radio Network together for an important episode inspired by the movie Moneyball. You know, we all have experience with people who are not our top performers, but are we better to have them on the team than not? You know them. They are consistent, reliable, steady, and contributors. Are they worth replacing? Will they become the best or top performers, or do they help strengthen our overall performance? A great discussion among your peers that I strongly believe will leave you with just one thing. Thanks to our sponsor, Shopware and Delphi Technologies, for providing you this episode. Hey, do you struggle to let go of your shop at the end of the day? When you see your end-of-day balance and how you're tracking this month, it's much easier, you know, to enjoy the ball game or that holiday or just some downtime. On the web, talk to my friends at GetShopware.com. Did you clean the fuel tank the last time you replaced a fuel pump? Contamination buildup in the tank not only impacts your vehicle's performance, but it can also damage your fuel pump. Clean your fuel tank in five minutes with Delphi Technologies Fuel Tank Cleaning Tool. Learn more at DelphiAftermarket.com. Hey, good afternoon, aftermarket peeps in North America. Carm Capriato, the Moneyball episode. This is going to be so, so much fun and very profound, I believe, as you uh, learn some of the ideas that we have to share with you. I think it's going to change how you may look at all of your people and uh, how you manage your KPIs. Hey, it's good to have you here. By the way, the Apex's awards are coming up. The deadline is coming up in just a very few weeks. At the end of August 31st, Wednesday, August 31st, shop owner, service advisor, technician of the year. On my panel, I just so happen to have last year's technician of the year with me. Please give a consideration to someone that you know that's had an exemplary year, is doing a lot of great things for the industry and your business or their business. AAPEX. Show.com forward slash service awards. Hey, I'd like you to meet my panel. Let me tell you, the logistics to pull the entire aftermarket radio network together it was, you know, it really worked well. I thank you all for finding time in your schedule to do this. Matt Fonslow, shop manager, Riverside Automotive, Red Wing, Minnesota, from diagnosing the aftermarket A to Z. Hello, Matt. Hello, sir. And Matt is the technician of the year from Apex last year. For a few more months. Yeah, a few more months. The raining, raining. The rain raining. ends. Coach Chris Cotton is here. Auto Fix Auto Shop Coaching from the Chris Cotton Weekly Blitz podcast. Hey, Chris. Hey, how are you guys doing? And uh, because I'm moving my daughter into Texas State, I'm going to give everybody, if there's any Texas State fans out there, eat them up, cats. <laughs> <laughs> is this her first year, freshman? Uh, she's a sophomore. So she's... We moved her into her first adult apartment today. Mom and I get to get her settled in and then leave. I remember doing that for Tracy. Oh, talk about the growing up thing, huh? Oh, yeah. Uh, Hunt Demarest is with us, CPA, Parmelis, uh, Business by the Numbers podcast. Hey, Hunt. Hey, Carm. Thanks for having me. Uh, glad you're here. And Kim and Brian Walker, Shop Marketing Pros, the Auto Repair Marketing Podcast. Hey, everybody. Hey, Carm. Matt and I talk often, if not we're sharing texts, or emails, or Slack. He calls me with some of the most off-the-wall ideas, and he says, Carm, we got to do a Moneyball episode. And I go, explain that one to me. <laughs> we're talking Jupiter here. Let's get down to Earth. And after he explained it to me, I said, I am so bought in. I would love to be able to bring the network together, and it actually did happen. I think every one of us has rewatched the movie Moneyball, and it is so much to do with taking a look at your people from a completely different perspective. You always don't have to hire home run hitters or rock stars to build a great and a solid team. So Matt, I'd love for you to start bringing the premise, and it started by me watching the Simon Sinek video, and we'll make sure we put that link in the show notes about SEAL Team 6. Yeah, I mean, there's a couple of things going on. I kind of worry with some of these ideas. I just get, you know, smashed over the head with too many different lines of things converging and maybe not mixing the way uh, I would hope they would. But the initial premise was a personal experience at the shop where I felt like I was deserving of a pay bump and kind of told no. I kind of went on a rampage of finding information to back up this 
desire. And the initial numbers I'm looking at for production hours really didn't support my uh, position. And um, it turned out I found something else that was probably more powerful in my favor is that when I would go to trainings or trade shows or whatever, when I was gone, shop production plummeted. And I'm not talking like a little bit. It was insane. You could circle the dates. Matt's not here. Shop production falls to drastically. So that's kind of what got me the uh, pay increase I was after. And then thinking about the movie and player evaluations and what are you paying for as a manager or an owner, somebody that's writing out the checks to people, what are you buying? And you're talking about in the movie uh, Moneyball, the owners are thinking about buying players. That's part of this rant by Peter Brand played by Jonah Hill. They're thinking about it wrong. And so as a shop owner, what are you buying? As a manager, when you're writing out paychecks, what are you paying for? And I think it's, you're paying for shop production hours that leads to profits. And from that premise, I think you have to step back and sometimes take a you know 10,000 foot view of the operation and how everybody integrates together to generate that end goal of profitability uh, and shop production. That's really what got the ball rolling on this idea. And what sold me, everyone was your analogy about the NBA. It sold me. And I said, that is such a parallel to our industry. And sports, right? A lot of people watch, not baseball especially, but basketball is kind of getting there too. We're, of course, watching the game. But then there's the stats, watching the statistics and paying attention to statistics. And the NBA, to start kind of getting an idea of the value that a player brings to a team created something called um, regularized uh, average plus minus, meaning when they're on the floor versus off the floor, how did that affect the overall team's performance? And what you would find is the heavy hitters are at the top, the ones you would expect, Kobe Bryant, LeBron James. Those names are usually at the top, Michael Jordan. But then you'd have these weird names pop up, Nick Collison, John Conkak. Who are the, who are these people? And they're little more than... The bench players, or they don't get tons of time, but it turns out they do things that allow their team to win. They do things that allow the main offensive weapon to get open and shoot or drive to the basket, score. You see it in hockey. The goons, they're paid a lot of money. You would never look at a stat line and go, they're worth all this money, but they're the reason that the superstars stay protected and get open to either pass or shoot. How does this apply to the shop? I think it applies quite well. It's just, again, you got to step back and look. You have to really watch what contributes to production. And once you really understand that, I think you can start looking at the other dynamics that you have with people that maybe aren't just churning hours, but they enable others to do their jobs better or they bring something to the table that's intangible. I got to go to Brian next. So importantly, Brian, you had a shop years ago, uh, which makes you so qualified to be a marketer for automotive shops and to have your own podcast on our network. Great story about someone who fits this exact analogy. Yeah, when I saw Matt's idea for this show, it stuck out to me immediately that I had one of the texts like he's talking about in my shop. So my shop was full of high producers. We were a Euro shop. So we were working on a lot of the same cars over and over, but my guys would, they would consistently turn 60 to 80 hours a week. And that was pretty much everyone in the shop, except for this one guy. And he would turn 30 hours, you know, every week, you know, give or take five hours. And if he hit that 35, it was a good week for him. But the thing is, he was so dependable. Like we could give him anything to work on. He would never complain about it. He never had comebacks. You could, you could count on it that no matter what we gave him, it was going to be fixed and it was going to be fixed right. And he also brought a lot to the culture of the, of the company. You know, the, the other techs just, they enjoyed working with him. They looked at him as a leader. You know, he was that guy that he was killing our pay, our per bay productivity on paper. But when it came down to it, he added so much to the shop that even if he was personally only turning 15 or 20 hours a week, you know, looking, Looking back on how much value he brought, I would have been very happy with that. You know, nothing tells a customer they need a new part faster than when they see a worn or broken one in their hands. Now, how do you do that in the digital age? Well, 
It's actually very easy. Thanks to DVX, you can send photos and videos within its messenger platform. It's like nothing else you've ever seen in an auto repair SMS before. Take the best of an Amazon-like experience and use it in your shop to show customers how great you are. DVX also makes it easy for customers to drop you a quick text or answer in the messenger bubble that arises from the repair order. It's like magic. Customers love seeing what they need to do and giving you a quick answer. You'll see your business's potential right in front of you. Your customers get on with their day and you get back to the repair. Everybody wins. It's time. Take it from me. GetShopware.com As the trusted aftermarket brand for over 100 years, Delphi Technologies is by your side for every step of the repair process. The Delphi journey doesn't stop once the parts are ordered. Wherever your journey takes you, our quality parts gives you ease of mind when getting your customer's vehicle back on the road. Technicians know and trust Delphi as a quality brand. Each product undergoes rigorous testing to not only meet OE standards, but also enhance it in each opportunity. From 700 hours of spray testing on chassis components to fuel pumps tested for reliability up to 150,000 miles. And safety and reliability is paramount to help vehicles drive cleaner, better, and further throughout their lives. Delphi is also committed in developing products and services to prepare technicians for the future. Take advantage of how-to videos on YouTube, technician-led trainings, and our technical support line, and more. Turn to the aftermarket parts supplier with over 100 years of OEM trust and quality. Learn more about Delphi. Visit DelphiAftermarket.com. Chris, I want to go to you next as a, as a coach in the industry. I've talked to enough coaches that says, listen, you always need to be recruiting talent. And when you find some really new, if you will, unicorn or superstar, replace your B or C player. This almost goes in contrast to that. It does, but we should always still, you know, have a strong bench, right? Like we should always be one of my big issues as a shop owner was I wasn't always recruiting and I probably turned away a lot of great technicians, but as an owner, I probably didn't have my head out of the clouds, we shall say, enough to notice what was going on with some of these other people. Like I knew the producers and the producers were great, but the ones that weren't I didn't have a metric to track it. I never thought about it. But now since we we've, we've started looking at this, then it makes me think, okay, so one, the shop owner has to be aware enough to recognize the people that aren't quote unquote top producers and what they're bringing to the table. And then how do we, how do we track that? So shop owners, we have KPIs. We have like 25 other coaching companies have like a hundred KPIs. But recently I've been working on like what I call a scorecard for success for like the different departments. So you could have a scorecard for success with five KPIs for the service advisors. Let's make a scorecard for success for the individual technicians. Like what are they bringing? How do they score? It can be pass fail. It can be, you know, A, B, C, D. And then, but then if we track it and measure it, then we can figure out, you know, who the star players are, who the star contributors are, and then figure out a way to reward them for it. Brilliant. Brilliant. Thank you for that. Hunt, I know you believe that productivity is a high number that your clients need to look at. How does this whole money ball concept play with you? Yeah, I think that the cool analogy here, especially using the NBA, because I think the stats in the NBA are the most relevant to what we're doing is if we're comparing this to the NBA, tech flag hours and how much production they have is what we would probably consider points for the NBA, right? It's a stat that everyone cares about. It's a stat that everyone measures. But it's also, there's players in the NBA where their points are higher and maybe disparagingly higher than anyone else because they're taking those points away from other people, right? And so where you would kind of equate that to a shop is, yeah, you got this guy that's flagging 60 hours, but is he flagging 60 hours because he is working that much harder? Or is he hoarding all of this work at the detriment of other technicians and ultimately at the detriment of the shop? You know, versus if you have that role player that's very balanced, that says, hey, I'm going to win when I win, but some of this stuff I'm going to get an assist for. I'm going to pass this off because I should not be doing this. I'm going to give Chris some work. I'm going to give Matt some work. And so instead of me getting 60 hours and the rest of the team getting 30, I'm going to get 30 hours and another three guys are going to get 30. Now we're at 120 for the shop because Obviously, all of the classic metrics of flat rate and flat rate pay rewards one person for what they're doing. 
But if you're a shop owner, I don't necessarily care. You know, if, if you are all my technicians, I don't care what Chris does. I don't care what Matt does. I don't care what Brian Kim does. I want this shop to produce 150 hours. And however we can do this in the most equitable way is going to be the most successful thing for me as the shop owner. Thanks for that. Chris, I got to go to you next. The premise of Moneyball in the beginning was to put people on the bench that could get on base. And in your case of doing some kind of analysis, if you will, that you were talking about in technicians, could getting on base or the level of contribution have be, be in your test? Yeah, absolutely. So one thing that I pushed the last year or so is wherever you stand on the, the tech crisis or shortage or whatever is one thing. But in the industry, we've done a terrible job of bringing support staff. And if I'm looking at productivity and what pulls, what bogs us down in productivity, if you have an A tech that's got to stop and do an oil service and a tire rotation, when he can knock out a water pump and timing belt that pays eight hours and three hours, then that takes us in one direction. So what we did is we came up with a production apprentice program and we pulled people in to do A-level type inspections. And what they do is they do the inspections, they complete what they complete, but then they put that higher paying, higher productivity work back into the pipeline. And then so off topic, off topic or whatever. But what we're also doing with these, with these entry-level production apprentice people is we're paying them an hourly wage. We're paying them a couple dollars hour kicker for what they do, but we're doubling that for what they put in the, in the pipeline that goes up to the upper technicians. So we're teaching them to be productive, find the work, and if they can't do it, move it forward. But if you look at it, like all of those are like assists, right, to the big star players. And what it does is it just increases productivity for everybody in the shop. And then before you know it, you've got a guy that's been there six months and he's building out 40 hours a week, but he's put in the pipeline 120 hours. Chris, I talk about this all the time. I think it is a genius title to a GS individual because I think it means so much more to the shop by having an individual that can be in even a bigger support role based on that title. And I think we could coach, teach, mentor that person. And what it does is like, depending on skill level and what you do, you can train that. And so I even have a PDF, like an eight-week training program. If anybody wants it, they can email me and then I can send it out or, or maybe we can put it in the notes somewhere, like where you start week one with that person and whatever. And then you train them up. And hopefully if you've done it well, six to eight months later, they're doing breaks, they're doing other services. And then, oh my gosh, you have to hire another production apprentice because this guy's doing 30, 40, 50, 60 hours a week in just breaks and other stuff. And you're raising the level. And again, we just looked at it from the fact that, okay, we can't get technicians, but we have all these people that could be great people. One of the reasons they wash out or leave is because they don't know where they're going. There's no path forward and they just lose interest. So you really have to crank those people up. Title of this episode is Numbers Don't Lie. They also don't tell the truth. And we call this our Moneyball episode. And Kim, relating to that, part of what you guys did as shop owners back in North Carolina was, and Brian was telling me that this gentleman he's talking about never had a comeback. There's got to be a huge rating for that. Yeah, absolutely. And speaking of that, and I'm thinking from the HR seat that I'm sitting in for Shop Marketing Pros, we have adjusted, you know, how we hire people here. And it goes back to the experience that we had with the shop. And a lot of times I'm thinking of that specific guy because it's the consistency that they bring. We call all of our team members leaders and they all are in their own right. But in our core values, leadership is one of them. When we're recognizing our team members, it comes from them nominating each other for something we call the shieldies. And I've been thinking about it all week as we were preparing for this episode today. And I went back and I was looking. It's funny to me that so many of our current team members who are submitting nominations for other team members, it's very often things like them referencing the consistency or the quality. It's rarely ever that they're pointing out that someone is a superstar because they're doing this many, you know, fill in the blank, you know, talking about stats or how many posts they're doing or how many ads they're doing. It's always referencing the quality of the person. And so oftentimes when we're hiring someone, 
I'm less looking for the actual, hey, do you have this specific skill? But I'm looking more at the type of person they they are, which leads to, are you coachable? Are you going to be a good team player? And so when you think about the shop, a lot of these people, I think Matt mentioned it first, some of them, just like in the movie last night, was you know, they were the support people. And so they might not be the rock stars that you think of. It's the ones that are making the whole team better, like Hunt was saying, you know, they're contributing in a way that when you step back and look at the whole picture, what is that quote? Brian's going to laugh because I always screw these things up, but a rising tide lifts all boats. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there you go. A rising tide lifts all boats. Hey, it's so honored to be part of the Aftermarket Radio Network with this entire team. Um, well over 1.2 million downloads this team has over our lifetime of being together. Matt, uh, again, I go back to uh, great talking points that we had on this. Please cover uh, the SEAL Team 6 piece because I think it has some reference here. Yeah, and I wanted to jump to piggyback off what Hunt was saying, like the, the team, right? It's I'm probably a broken record when I say about the team or the organism. It works together. We've got different areas of the shop, you know, the front of house, the back of house. They have to work together to get that end goal of desired profit. Because that team's in mind, uh, or with that idea of team in mind, it became very important what Simon Sinek says about his discussions and studying of the SEAL teams, about thinking a SEAL team or SEAL Team 6, whatever. They would be made up of the best of the best of the best of the best. Just the highest performing individuals, they're you know robotic or just next level uh, athletes, killers, whatever. And it turns out that's not the case. There may be some like that, but they're super rare. SEAL teams are made up of people that are high trustworthiness. So it's you know a graph made with performance, trustworthiness. And of course, perfect world would be high performance, high trustworthiness. That would be you know great. It just doesn't exist in great numbers. So they value trustworthiness over performance. They would rather have lower performing individuals who are very trustworthy over just purely high performance, low trustworthiness. So, you know, do I trust you with my life? Do I trust you with my wife is the difference. And they go after the trust, trust them with their wife that they got their back. They're going to work together. They're going to work as a team. And there's so many examples of this on YouTube, just watching the buds or hell week where they have to do these team activities. The ones that succeed work together. They pick the guy up that's tripping and falling. They work together. It's not me, 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 me. And when you have this type of a setting and this kind of a thought process, I think you can start looking at current employees as well as perspective. What do I value? Like, you know, I'm looking at these numbers and boy, they really turn the, turn the hours. But man, I'm picking up bad vibes about this personality. Like, am I bringing something caustic in? Am I better off taking somebody that yeah, I had pretty good vibes with, seem to get along with everybody just in the walkthrough, even though their numbers aren't quite as high? And it's tough to think about. I'm not really telling anyone what to do, but it's I think it's got to be thought about. The numbers don't lie, but they also don't tell the truth. We can't talk about that without mentioning Simpsons Paradox. We have to, because nobody gets taught that. I don't know anybody that went to high school and was taught in statistics Simpsons Paradox. But what it essentially is, is you can look at statistics, you can look at these numbers and derive two answers or whatever that are 180 degrees different, yet the numbers say they're true. And where this becomes a problem is humans are very, very biased. We're loaded with confirmation bias. So we look for things that back up our worldview. So if I'm thinking that this person's low performance because of effort and I pulled numbers, even though Simpsons Paradox is at work, these numbers could point to two different directions. Guess which one I'm going to side with? That's why I think it's important to consider that numbers don't lie but they don't necessarily tell the truth either. Trust me, I've done it. You've let a low trust person go and the whole team rises. Everybody's shaking their head. If you're listening through audio, everyone's shaking their head. It's amazing to know that someone with high values that's reliable and consistent as a team player that may not be, as we were saying, the, the most productive person, but they add, they're like glue. They're like good stitching. They keep everything together. Sometimes people come in and they see this individual, as you guys were saying, Kim, Brian, 30 hours, and they're there. Everybody says, wow, wow. 
The break is here. You automatically think you want someone who's high performing and high trustworthy. But when you really kind of back up and look at it, those who are who are high performing, very often they're egotistical, they're self-centered. But then you think about the ones who are trustworthy and you know, the the rest of the team, who are they going to go to when they need something? They're going to go to the trustworthy person. And a lot of times the one who's high performing, you know, they think they have some secret. They can't share how well they did this or how well they did that. And so I think that that, that plays is just a huge part of it. I loved that piece when they were explaining that. So I was really glad that you shared that, Matt. We'll have the link in the show notes. Chris? So I had a thought on the scorecard for success because I've always built it around the team like the and not the individual. So while we were talking, I scribbled it down. Like what five to six criteria could I do for an individual person to measure this? I'm not going to mention pro- productivity at all. Number one is comebacks. Two is punctuality. Three is good attitude. Four is trained. And that's a big thing because everybody seems to, all the technicians that I run across seem to think that it's okay not to train anymore because they have us over barrel. And then fifth is goes out of their way to help others. And when I say that it could be other technicians, it could be service advisors. It could be seeing somebody, you know, maybe you've got a tech, you've got this technician that's he's by the front door and everybody comes in and stops him and says, hi. And he's the one airing up tires and doing all the free stuff that nobody talks about. Maybe that's it. So maybe that's a quick thing for everybody to think about for like a scorecard for those people and pay plans is a big thing because a lot of times when we do pay plans, we pit everybody against each other and not as a team, but you have to have the culture to do that. Recently, I had the the pleasure of doing a pay plan for somebody on the West Coast. The minimum wage is like $13.10 now, $14 an hour. Everybody, including the owner, gets minimum wage. doesn't matter who you are, what you do. You push a broom, you're the A-tech, B-tech. Everybody gets minimum wage. And then at the end of the week, they check gross profit and everybody splits the gross profit, a percentage of it. And that's what you get paid. And they thrive in that. They are like, okay, I got to build this ticket. I got to hurry. I got to hustle. I got to do this. And, you know, all these pay plans have their merits, but you have to find the one that works for your people and incentivize greatness. Yeah. One of the things that I think that we see a lot too is you never have a technician or really any employee that doesn't have some redeeming quality, right? And so the ones with the terrible attitude that, you know, are awful to deal with, you know, no one likes to, to be around, they play their music too loud, you know, they're flagging like 60 hours a week, right? You can't get away with that and then also not be a producer. Same thing that you see in sports, like, hey, you can't have a big personality, be a knucklehead, be getting arrested. But, you know, we're not going to drop any names here and don't know what type of sports fans we're listening to. (laughs) But, you know, if you're the star, if you're the star athlete, maybe if you're the quarterback, you know what? There's a certain amount of stuff that we'll let you get away with and we'll look the other way on it. And I feel like that there's a lot of shop owners, especially I see people as they kind of grow with their business. Because when you first open a shop, I think most people say, hey, I want a team full of 60-hour producers. I want killers out here that are going to be able to do this. But then as you see people grow with their business, they're like, I don't want three people 60 hours. Maybe I still want that one guy that doesn't have the best attitude that can just knock out work. But I want people that are going to be able to have a good attitude because I value that more than just straight hours going out the door. Well, in the end, it has to be a great place to work, right? Or else you're going to have turnover for technicians and everything and everybody else. Early on in my career, I probably lost really, really great technicians because I wasn't paying attention enough when somebody came to me and said, hey, I'm leaving to investigate it further and be like, why are you leaving? I think we did one about exit interviews not too long ago. That's part of it. Like you have to be aware of what's going on in the shop in order to do this. Because if you're not aware at all, then this, this whole thing goes out the window. You know, we keep talking about strengths and I see Bill, Bill Connor posted about the strengths. And I think, I think Hunt, you just mentioned it as well. There, there are so many tools out there. And I think Brian, remind me, I feel like we did this at our shop, which was many years ago, but we're starting to look at implementing that even more here in our business now with regard to personality assessments or whatever you want to call them, Strengths Finder 2.0. You can really learn a lot about people and they, they can't, you can't really manipulate those, right? It's They ask like the same thing five different ways. And you might try to, oh, you know, I really want someone trustworthy. Let me answer it this way. You can't fool those assessments. And it really pulls out some of these exact things we're talking about. You know, how do you really grade or give a score to someone when you're talking about these character traits? But those, those assessments really 
pull that out. And I don't know if y'all have been using those in your, if anybody uses those in the shop, I feel like you did a podcast on that once, um, Carm, but you know, those things are, they're real. Yeah, you know, where you're really popular. I think big five is now like the dominant mm-hmm. personality type quiz used by the psychological community. Where, where you really find out about people though is, is when things go wrong. I'm going to be a little bit vulnerable here. So we made a big mistake for one of our clients here a couple of weeks ago. It actually goes back further than that, probably about six weeks ago when it started. We've got the specialty shop that we work with that they, they rebuild a very specific type of heavy duty truck and they have nationwide ad campaigns. So we're talking about pretty big budgets that we're working with. And we were working with Google on this to make sure that everything was set up right. And it wasn't. And it blew through $12,000 worth of ad budget in a very short period of time without producing any results at all. And when I found out about this immediately, it was like, that is not my client's problem. That is my problem. So, you know, there was, there was no question about who was going to pay for that mistake. And we've talked to the client. We let them know, hey, we're covering this. You know, we, that's, that's our mistake. $12,000 coming out of our pocket to take care of this. But this was done. It was, it was settled. It was over with. But the young lady who I have, you know, working for us who was running those ads actually messaged me yesterday and said, hey, I need to talk to you about something where, and, you know, I call her up, talk to her. And she says, I found something where I messed up that contributed to this even more. And when she did that, I was, I was blown away because I would have never known had she never said anything to me. And when you talk about the, the trustworthiness and the way that I will look at her going forward, like I will never, ever wonder, is she telling me the truth about something? Because she sets the bar for integrity in our business. And, you know, everyone else that sees that, you know, do you think that someone else is, gonna, is going to lie about something, especially something little, when, you know, they see somebody come to me with a big issue like that? And then, you know, of course, a lot of it has to do with, too, how we react to things like that, you know, as the the owners of the business. But, you know, from a trustworthiness standpoint, she just made a fan for life out of me as if she wasn't already. Be sure you nominate her for an award. <laughs> <laughs> but don't you think that that is like something that is so common that, you know, culture is contagious, right? And then just as quickly as, you know, you probably share that with the rest of your team. And they're like, OK, hey, not only was that a cool thing, also, you know, kudos to you guys and be able to handle it well and not chopping your hands off like, oh, I never knew that. Now that I know this, I'm going to punish you even worse, right? Like, let's reward people for, you know, being vulnerable and being honest about that. But it's also a lot of times you see this in a shop too, or really any business, you know, you have the canary in the coal mine. It's like, so if you allow bad attitudes or bad habits to go on, everyone else is kind of looking at that, right? So if you have that guy that's always showing up late, but he's that top producer, you know what? We're going to let that slide for him. And then if I'm another technician, I'm like, well, why do I have to come on time? Or maybe I'll start showing up late. You know, same thing. It's like, hey, you know what? Service advisor, service manager dispatches this work. I know Steve is always going to scream at a service advisor. He doesn't want that crap, you know? And so it's, again, this is contagious around there, you know? And so being able to reward some of this good behavior and hopefully that becomes more contagious than some of this negative, negative, you know, cancerous energy that can sometimes happen. It's a great point. I want to go back to the movie. Since I watched it last night again for the second time, and it is so fresh in my mind, they put a player on first base who wasn't a first baseman and said, teach him. And so to your point about training, Chris, and I'm huge on training as a pillar of the strategy of the company, training, training, training. Listen, this guy hits base hits. We have no other place put him on first base. He doesn't know how to play first base. Teach him how to play first base. And someone asked him, what do you have the most fear of? And he says, somebody hits the ball to me. (laughs) But you can't can't train someone unless you know if they admit to you that they have a a weakness in in the learning curve, right? I think it's a great movie to share with your leadership team and in every one of our businesses and say, there's anything here. Can we relate to any of it? And how can we learn from it? A ton. I I wish they would have shown 
maybe some of that, like how they trained him to become a first baseman. Cause right as an industry, we suck at training people like serious, like onboarding and training is worse in our industry than anywhere else on the planet. Like you bring in a new service advisor in with experience. Okay. Here's your desk. Here's a point of sale. Here's a phone. Good luck. See you next week. Same thing with the technician. Here's your bay. Got your tools. Here's how you log in. Here's how you log out. Maybe I'm going to show you tablet. And then we're off to the races. And then three months later, when that person's always said he's flagged 50 hours, but he's flagged 30 and he's still trying to figure out where the oil filters are or whatever, you have to make that a process. And I really, really work hard with my clients. Uh, I've got one that we kind of had that issue with. And I was like, okay, just like the productivity assistant, we're going to come up with a, with like a, like a six week training plan for a new employee period, what their experience is. So we brought in a new technician that we really, really needed. And it was a week before we let him turn a wrench. Like the first day he shadowed the service advisors to see what they do. The second day he was with his mentor out in the shop. The third day, all he did was write fake DVIs to learn how we wanted them. And so instead of pushing everybody out there, can you imagine how that movie would have turned out if they just thrown him on first base and been like, good luck. And, and that's what we do. And it, we throw our hands up when people leave and quit and wash out and everything else, but it's all our own fault. Sorry, I don't even know where I was going with that. But anyway, that's what popped into my head. Well, it, it's, it's true, though, about, you know, st- uh, training people and onboarding and all of that. There, there's a, a study that was done with employees about what they want most from their employer. And this kind of blew me away. And I honestly didn't really believe it at first when I heard it. But, you know, the study showed that the thing they want most is access to the owner of the business. Like they want to be able to learn from them. They want to be able to like have a relationship with them. They, they want that mentorship. And one of the things that I've recently done in my own business was make it very, very clear to all of our people that I am here. Like if you need something from me, I am here. And, you know, coming from the world of auto repair, I I mean, I was a, a diagnostic tech. And the funny thing about diagnostics is that once you really learn the diagnostic process, it's not just about cars. It's about everything. If you can diagnose a car, you can diagnose what's happening in a business. You can diagnose what's happening in, in marketing. The principles are the same all the way you know, through. And I've been able to work with my team and begin to teach them that diagnostic process. And they're learning skills on the marketing side of things that is making them better. And it's all because I made it a point to prove to you know, like to show them I'm here and I'm available and I want to I want to work with you you know when you need some help such a great point Matt I want you to go next but wow diagnosing the aftermarket A to Z is the name of Matt's podcast and you just nailed it Brian just exactly how Matt not only looks at any challenge he has in the shop but in life too uh, yeah and going back to the movie too building on what you're saying there's a couple other things that go on that I really, really like. I think you can take this movie and watch it, you know, regularly, like annually. And one of the, another idea is at some point, Billy Bean, Brad Pitt's character goes around and talks to specifically David Justice, but kind of everyone to get them on board with the team goal. What are we trying to do here? Buy into the system. If I can get everyone to buy into the system and trust, trust me, trust the coaches, what we're trying to do here, we're going to work better together and we're going to achieve this goal. And I thought that was really important because I think a lot of times not everybody knows exactly where they fit in. Kind of like Brian and Chris are saying, like, here's your keys, here's your station, here's your uh, spot, get to work. And not only are you fumbling around with just that specific task, but you don't know where you fit in the system. And uh, the other thing I really liked is the Peter Brand character, Joan Hill, sitting with all the players and talking, watching video and talking about weaknesses or strengths and pointing it out, saying, you know, you'd, suspension work, you're, you're maybe the best I've ever seen. But when we get you in powertrain or something like that, things dip. I've been watching you and I think some of it's a comfort level or some of it's, you know, when you're working on suspension systems, you have your cart, you have all these tools kind of ready to go. But when you're working on powertrain stuff, you don't do that. And I think that could really help. Might be just little things pointing out. I thought that was really important, like helping people, helping your people succeed at every position, you know, service advisor, observing. Yeah, you can sit back, look at the numbers, but sometimes it's good to just sit back and watch. 
observe and maybe talk to a customer on their way out, meet them at the car. Like, hey, can I have a couple minutes? What do you think? What would you give me for some advice? What would you like to see different? And then go back with some data, not right away, just run in after I talk into that customer and light into them. But hey, I've been watching you now for a few weeks. You do this so well, so well. I have some ideas though. What do you think? When you approach it the right way, not that we always have to handle people with kid gloves, but a lot of times they appreciate that because ultimately I am trying to help you succeed because if you succeed, everybody succeeds. You know, Chris brought up uh, training, training, training. Chris, I've written blogs on it. We've done shows on it. I'm getting to the point where I'm hating to just in what I do and what we all do to advance the aftermarket, just this lip service, okay? You know, sometimes we just talk about it, talk about it. And we recently did an episode on how you do these things. Okay, we, we need to go out and talk to the, the parents. Well, exactly how is that done? It's almost like, let me show you tab A, slot B. And... We talk about mentor. We drop mentor mentee all the time. No one knows what it really is. No one knows the structure, the disciplines about it. And in about three weeks, we're going to do an episode, mentor mentee. And there's some software out there. There's a company out there that will assess mentors and mentees and literally set up the training program to help make everything that that team mentor mentee has to do to make you at your pleasure of moving them through the ranks because we all know that not every seniorist person is the best mentor. So we're going to do that soon. I did have one thing to talk about what Matt was talking about. So it's easy for Billy Bean, Brad Pitt to go around and have these conversations with people, but shop owners are not typically great communicators and they're super scared of confrontation. So guess what's not going to happen? Either one of those things. You have to work your way through these uncomfortable moments. And if you go back, I think it's, I don't know what episode it is, but Weekly Blitz, it's um, Eating the Elephant or the Notebook Technique. You go in, you have a meeting with every one of your employees every week, every two weeks to start, and you start having these conversations. The more you have them, the easier it will be for you. I'm not going to get into the structure of it and everything like that. But if you're hiding in your office and you're ducking these uncomfortable moments and you're not looking for teaching coachable moments, then what you allow is what will continue. And it's never going to get better. You're never going to advance your business. It's, it's just going to, you're just going to suck less. Aftermarketradio.com. Click on Chris's pretty face on that homepage. And then when you get to his little mini website, it's, Episode 26 on uh, eating the elephant. Carm has them all memorized, right? He already knew what that was. No, he looked it up real quick. Yeah. <laughs> I, it up. I think one thing that hasn't been brought up, you know, that is a big part of Moneyball, what they were trying to do is also the profitability side of this, right? Yep. You know, because if you go to sports, like you could build the best team ever, especially in baseball where, you know, there is no true salary cap. You know, there's excise tax and, and luxury tax and stuff like that. But, you know, if you wanted to go and you wanted the best technicians, then put out an ad that you're going to pay the top technician $400,000 a year. You can pull people from all over the country and they'll come and they'll probably do a really, really good job for you because you're the only person paying that much. And you could go down the list and you could have the highest paid lube tech in the country, highest paid service advisor, and you could pull in the dream team, but you're probably never going to make any money. There might be some people sitting here right now that are thinking about their for their shop of like, I have the best people, I pay the most money, but I'm the lowest paid person here because it doesn't really work. And so all about what you're trying to do here is you're trying to do that fine balance, right? So you're like, I want the top people, I want to pay them super well, but at the end of the day, this is still a business. And you know, that's where I kind of thought of this was when Chris was talking about the apprentice, right? The role players, you know, the general service that are really the glue that not only holds a team together from a culture wise, those are also really the people that are driving profit, right? If you can have this hourly kid that's making 16 bucks an hour, now he's not doing diagnostic work, but maybe he's flagging 30 hours. That is like the golden goose right there because he is just printing you money, you know, and being able to balance this team of like super high paid, super high performer with kind of, you know, these higher efficiency from a dollars and cents type standpoint is huge. And you see that on a team, right? Hey, you got that player that is in there for the league minimum, but he is really doing, you know, way above what he's getting paid versus these guys that, you know, yeah, they're costing you a fortune. Well, they better give you a ton of results. Well, $114 million 
game was the Yankees payroll versus the $39 million that the uh, that Oakland Athletics had. And, of course, they went into the, into the next year and did 20 games in a row. I believe it's a stat that still hasn't been broken uh, with a ragtag team. And so <laughs> the beauty of the of the entire movie is you, you can assemble it if the heart and the soul and the trust and people can perform their basic role. Now, can we have one more thing on that? Because there is a downside, and I see this also in shops as well. So I'm unfortunately an Orioles fan, right? And anyone that <laughs> follows baseballs knows if you have someone good on the Orioles, the Orioles will not pay them. So that person is going to become good. The fans are going to get attached to it. And as soon as free agency hits, we've lost that person. And I see that a lot also with business owners as well. Like, hey, and if you want to keep these people around, a, you, you know, on sports, it's mostly just pay, right? They don't care what their coach says. So if you give me a good contract, I'll stay here. But it's like continuity is the exact opposite of probably profit in some situations. Hey, if you want to keep this team around, if you want to keep this team together, you better take care of them. You better empower them and you better pay them accordingly. Now, if you only care about profit and you want to just, you know, not that Peter Angelos, the owner of the Orioles is doing this, but it's pretty much what he is. He is focusing solely on profit. So he says, you know what, we're going to keep the lower farm system team or farm system players in there because our revenues are still up here, but we're keeping our payroll down low. But what happens is now we have a revolving door where anyone says, oh, hey, I love Adam Jones. Well, Adam Jones is gone. Manny Machado is gone, right? All of these players, once they find some success, just leave. And you don't want that to be your business. That's a great point, Hunt. We had a great camp meeting on Monday, and I think a lot of stuff has happened out of it. Long conversations, uh, short, we're talking about bringing in people, getting ATEX $45, $50 an hour. And I was having the follow-up conversation with a shop owner and this outdated thinking or mode of thought. He's like, you want me to advertise for a technician for $50 an hour? And he goes, I I expect, I guess you want me to pay all my other technicians $50 an hour too now. And I'm like, exactly. And he flopped, <laughs> he flopped like a fish for like six minutes. It was just like this big mouth open, gasping for air, flop, 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 flop. And again, it's just the outdated thinking. Like people, you have to let all, you have to let anything you knew before 18 months ago go and it's new. And guess what? Your next 18 months is going to be brand new. So what, you, what you're thinking about today is nothing two years from now. Stretch, try it. Oh my God, yes. We have a podcast dream team here. Thank you all for finding the time in your schedule to come here to talk about uh, the Moneyball movie or Numbers Don't Lie. They also don't necessarily tell the truth. I thought this was great. It was all about our peoples and their capabilities and things they put together. I'm going to go around the room. Matt, Hunt, uh, Coach Chris, Kim, and then Brian will each have anything left that you'd love to cover. And then we'll say goodbye to our great audience. Matt? I guess I don't want to imply all this is so easy. I guess first I want to campaign that every shop installs a home theater and <laughs> uses that to watch any movie and try to apply it to auto repair. Then also that I don't want to imply that this is so easy to do that when I start thinking about the systems and processes and all the intricacies of generating the goal of you know desired profit, ethical profit, I sometimes get overwhelmed thinking about all the little things that apply and can contribute. But I think it's very valuable to think about and put yourself in a very good position to be able to do it, have the time to study it, be it study the numbers, make sure you check your bias at the door, and then uh, just sit back and watch. You know, Even if you've got video cameras, uh, just to sit back and watch, not to be hypercritical, but watch the process, watch how everybody works. And with the eye being the idea and your eye looking for ways to help them be better, remove obstacles. That's my favorite thing with management is how can I remove the obstacles preventing you from doing your best work and enjoying yourself as much as possible, right? Thanks, Matt. I have to tell you, this entire team, including myself and all the episodes that we've done over a thousand episodes, we got some great content on there. And if anyone is saying, where do I go for this information? We, as a collective team, have it. And I have to tell you, there's some of the most cutting-edge concepts and theories and and ideas and business acumen in the entire Aftermarket Radio Network. So, again, I'm I'm honored to have you all here. By the way, this isn't the the last movie episode that we're going to do. We've been chatting about other things. Tracy just mentioned we should do an episode on Miracle. Just because it's hockey, 
Come on. Which is interesting. Matt and I and Tracy actually got together and said how we have to do an episode about the Godfather movies so that that may be coming. I'm in on Godfather out on hockey. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Hunt, your final comments. We'll see Tracy's uh, Miracle and Razor slap shot. <laughs> Yeah, no, I think the big thing is, you know, well, first off, Matt, this was an awesome idea. You know, I think when you first said it, I was like, I don't even know what you're talking about. But the more and more, it's like, wait, there is so many parallels here. It's like you said, it's not easy. And you really got to dictate what you want your business to look like. If you are focused 1000% on profit, then yeah, get the team in place. Who cares about the culture numbers and maybe run your crew completely understaffed. Now, if you want a long-term successful business that's ultimately going to be easier for you as a business owner to run, then you got to have the right team in place. You got to be able to balance a budget, be able to fill in people in the right spots, find deals where you can, and get, create an environment that is conducive of that. But yeah, just like Matt said, this is easier said than done. This is not something that happens overnight, but you got to have a plan. You got to have a vision of what you want it to look like before it's just going to magically appear. Thanks so much, Hunt. Coach Chris. Leave the gun, take the cannoli. Again, on this topic of, you know, everybody's fat, happy, lazy. The last two years have been great. People are stacking up money. I've never had as many shop owner vacation all the time. It's crazy. Get out from behind the desk, or if you're not in your office, get behind the desk. Have the uncomfortable conversations. Look for people in your company that, that need to be coached and coach them. Think back when you were in the same role. What did you want from your owner? And give, give your people that, what you didn't have. And just be an active participant. All right? Great advice, Chris. Kim? The only thing that I really have left is, is the main character, Billy Bean. Right? He was put in the position as a player way too early. And we all saw what happened is that he really bombed out. He wasn't ready. He was too young. He wasn't, he probably still needed to go to college and get some of that training that we're talking about. So I think it's really about being careful about putting people in a position before they're ready. Wow. How powerful. What a great wrap up. That's a key. It goes to training and mentoring right there. Wow. Thanks for that, Kim. Brian? There was one other thing that I saw in the movie that stood out to me a little bit. There's a scene where David Justice is in the locker room and he's he's going up to the soda machine and he's hitting the button. Nothing's coming out. One of the guys comes by and is like, you got to put a dollar in there. And he's like, are you kidding me? You know, what is that thing in your shop? You know, you may not be able to afford the the top dollar players, but you can create a work environment for them that is better than anywhere else. You know, what are the things that you can provide? Are your techs having to still pay for their own gloves? Um, you know, do you have things like a lot of shops now they've got sodas and candy bars and stuff for their clients. Do you have that for your staff? You know, what are the little things that you can do that will take care of them that are just enough to say, you know what, I appreciate you that could make an impact in your business. Profound. So Brian, I've got a client that, they shut down one extra day a month. Like they have one, if they can wrap it around a holiday, they'll have a four day weekend. But if there's not a holiday, they close down on a Friday and give everybody a three day weekend. That takes the whole shop out of productivity for one day. And, and basically we're calling it a mental health day, but the guy still does over 200 grand a month being shut down one day less than everybody else. It's like Chick-fil-A being closed on Sundays. Yeah. That's a sore subject, Kim. We're not going to talk about that. They need to change that. No one wants Chick-fil-A more than on a Sunday. It's this just is not fair. So true. Yeah, but but we need a fleet of trucks to park in Chick-fil-A and say not Chick-fil-A and be open <laughs> on Sunday with our, with our little chicken trucks. Park in the drive through and let them, let them go right by you. you see, yep. <laughs> see, these are entrepreneurs, capitalists right here. Matt Fonslow, Chris Cotton, Hunt Demarest, Kim and Brian Walker. Thank you. Thank you, Thank sir. Carm. Thank you. All right. So the, the tape is still running. So if anyone who wants to have any outtakes, you can start. <laughs> oh, my God. So Matt and I and Tracy, and I can't remember if we were doing this in Slack or on the phone, talked about the Godfather movie. And then Tracy tells her story. Oh, way back when she was still living at home, all of a sudden it's Christmas. We've already had the parties the day before with the families the night before Christmas Eve. So here it is. We get up, we exchange a couple of small final gifts. And then all of a sudden here comes the, the violin music from the Godfather. And Anne says, 
Oh my God, what are you guys doing? And so we would just, we'd get wine and bread and oil and olives. And I did not grow up watching a Christmas story. <laughs> I, I still have not finished. I've never seen the movie. Like I know it's like very iconic, but everyone's watching a white Christmas miracle on 34th street, you know, Christmas story. And we're watching Godfather casino. Or you Goodfellas. didn't miss out on anything, Tracy. I would, I would love to have that Christmas. Like I'm down, <laughs> like, like I'll bring my, um, I'll bring my onesie and my blanket and pillow. And we'll just watch all three episodes of the Godfather Christmas morning. Right, we'll, I'm there. We'll dri- uh, drive up to Buffalo when it comes December. I, I keep waiting for Brian to share, but if he's not, I will. We have never seen the Godfather series. Don't start. Oh, no. No, it's not healthy. It'll change your life. <laughs> I've, so, seen hey, the, I've seen the first one. I haven't seen, but I've heard that the sequels, oh. you're not allowed to watch this. I thought they were terrible. No, two is the best. They're all great. And if we're all going to be at Apex or whatever, we need to rent a movie theater and just... That <laughs> We got brought up because we got separated on the plane Listen into to different aisles. It was on purpose. And so we had, you know, the movies, you know, going or whatever. And so I'm going through looking which movie I want to watch. I see he has Godfather Part 1, 2, and 3. Ah. So when we got off the plane, I said, so which... Godfather, did you watch? And he starts laughing. I did part one. I did. I said I did part three. I knew you would not get past the G's in alphabetical <laughs> order. That would stop you right there. <laughs> so when, when we went to Europe, we're sitting there on the plane. Kimberly's in between us. Piper's on the other side. And I look over and Piper's just like full tears meltdown on the plane in the middle of the night crossing the Atlantic. And I go, what are you watching? And she goes, I've never seen Forrest Gump before. <laughs> and she's just like, just like dying from Forrest Gump on the on the plane. That's a good movie. That is a great, That's a great movie. movie. Probably a I lot got, of lessons got, to be learned there. Oh, there's a I lot of lessons. With, I'm texting Peyton right now to ask him. Have we? Have you ever watched Kim and Brian? Have you Gump? guys seen uh, Goodfellas or Casino? No. All right, we got a lot of homework, guys. No, no, they're bad movies. They're bad. Just, they're just. Do you guys bad. Want me, I don't. Do you guys want me to start doing like some of the movies that I get to watch now that I have three kids? You know, how Frozen. about how about how does it translate to Sonic the Hedgehog two? You know what? Some people argue some of Jim Carrey's best work. I saw about half of that over the shoulder of my daughter on her iPad on our last flight. So that was a good one. I've seen Frozen about 87 times, so I'm probably pretty good on that one as well. I cried at Co- I cried of Coco and uh, and Co- Coco and Onward. On some of them, yeah, like the kids those. don't catch onto the undertones, and yeah, you're watching it, you're like, this is really sad, and my daughter's like, this is really good. I'm like. Well, same with like Up. Like Up is like supposed to be a kids movie. Oh, that one's really sad too. Like there's a couple of them. Yeah, and so Peyton has not seen Forrest Gump. What a horrible what? parenting fail! I know, Chris. He also says that he's watching Disney movies that. with them. But I'm like, whatever. My right, messenger so got what lit up. What do you guys watch then, Kim and Brian? Like, what are your like faves? If you haven't watched Godfather Casino, I think Mulan it's Rouge, like Tombstone. <laughs> Tombstone. Wrong. Tombstone is a classic. phenomenal movie. Yep. That is my favorite movie ever. That is a phenomenal movie. You have changed your mind about your favorite oh, movie ever. Like Outlaw Josie Wales. Yep. <laughs> I'm for That's, October. Home for Red October is a good. Yeah, it's usually like action flicks, military kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. That's what have always been our go tos. Somehow, once a month, we got to do a movie episode related to our industry. We can nail it every time. Wow. Our church does a, um, a lot of churches have been doing this. It's a trend for the last couple of years. Like our church is named The Mission. So it's movies at the mission and they'll, they'll pull a movie and they'll pull out lessons from it and relate it to scripture. It's, it's a really fun. Fun series, so I, I I vote I vote yeah, Carm. I think it's a really cool idea. Yeah, I love it. I really do. Movies is part of our culture. You guys haven't all binged watched Waiting. I talked about I it in one. my. I think it was the last one. Oh, the one I did with Hawken. Yeah, I talk about Waiting. I felt I wa- tried watching it under your recommendation. I fell asleep. Yeah. I have to watch it again. You talking about Waiting with Ryan Reynolds? Yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't know that one. It is basically to anybody that's worked at a restaurant. It's their office space. Yeah, that's what I think if you if you haven't worked in a restaurant, it wouldn't be as funny. But like I grew up like my first job was at an Italian pizza restaurant. And it's like, yeah, it's all the same characters at every restaurant. I saw it. I I have seen that movie. 
This is Garrett, everybody who hasn't who hasn't met Garrett. Hi everyone. Hi Garrett. Hey Garrett. Look at that teamwork. Hey G man. So hey, what did we decide on the wedding? Because I think we had a big conversation about three or four months ago, and we're like, um, uh, we all get to go, go to Vegas or something, and he has to give it to us. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Yeah, <laughs> we all like get in to the go Godfather the office. Like you go, we go into the oh, office. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they can't refuse. They can't refuse. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good idea. We need a separate need to room do- for my dad at the wedding so he can receive. <laughs> And the whole time he has to use that voice, like speech, yep. everything. He has to use that voice. With a cat, with a cat. Wherever we go, if we're out with business or whatever, and I happen to get the end of the table, I always I always sit down and says, I invited all of you here for a particular reason. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. I can see it all too well. <laughs> You know when you found the cat on set? It That's wasn't in the script. Yeah, the cat was a last-minute ad. Hey, gang, uh, thank you so much. So appreciate this. Good episode, guys. We got to Thanks do so a, much, everybody. Another We're movie have a good weekend. Right, Have bye-bye. a good weekend. See ya. See ya. See you, guys. Thanks for being on board to listen and learn from the premier automotive aftermarket podcast. Until next time...